Okay, good afternoon everyone. Thank you all for joining us today in our weekly webinar series. Today our featured topic is selecting appropriate cable and connectors. My name is Jessica Petrohoy and marketing coordinator at fiberoptic.com. Fiberoptic.com is the leading provider of fiber optic products, training, and rental equipment. We're pleased to present this topic to you today. Now with us today to talk about selecting appropriate cable and connectors is Joseph Kyrim. Joe is a product manager for the Adtel Group and supply chain and logistics leader offering over 20 years of hands-on experience across a range of industries. Now Joe will be discussing the factors to consider when choosing cable and connectors for your fiber optic network. And when Joe is finished, we will take questions from the GoToWebinar question box at the bottom of your screen for a question and answer session. Remember, our webinar is always posted online at fiberoptic.com slash webinar. Uh, thank you again for joining us today. And at this time, I turn the presentation over to Joe. Thank you, Jess. And welcome, everybody, to this webinar on selecting appropriate cable and connectors. I will go and give a brief understanding of cable connectors, features, technical aspects of cable, give you a better understanding of how to go about selecting cable. And with that, I'm going to jump right into the presentation. So today's agenda, again, as I said before, it's going to, we're going to go over types of cables, types of connector, and also I think polish is thrown in there and uh, a little bit of cable design of what you need to know when you're designing a cable or selecting some type of cable assembly. So there's about six factors to consider when you have to pick cable. Application is one of them. What are you going to use it for? Is it going to be inside, outside? Is it going to be in a building? Is it going to be underground? So your application is very important. Bandwidth requirements. How much data are you going to be shoving down this cable? You know, are we going to start at 1G? Are we going to be doing 10G? Or are we going to you know, maybe start out with 10 or 1G now, but we want to expand it to 100G down the road? They're all things, you know, future expandability is, is one of the things you want to look at when it comes to bandwidth. Again, types of cable, indoor, outdoor, indoor, direct aerial, aerial. There's a whole bunch of them out there, and we'll touch a little on a little bit of each. What's your structure, your cable structure, and where is it going to be? Inside plant or outside plant? That's really the two areas your cable is going to be. There's not other, you know, it's either inside or it's outside. Now, if it's outside, how are you going to, is it going to be an aerial deploy, deployment, or is it going to be buried? Um, there's direct burial cable. You can put cable and conduit. There's a lot of things that you can do with there. And, of course, budget. Money always comes into play when it comes to cable. Uh, the main thing is you want to, Select your fiber once, and you want to install it once. You don't want to have to pull it out and put it in again. So that's important to remember. So your applications, you can see there's a whole slew of applications here, from telephone to broadcasting. Um, you know, the tactical, might, you can also say that's the military. But believe it or not, there are cable companies out there that manufacture cable to specific specifications based on the application and where it's used. And a lot of that has to do with the type of jacketing that goes around the cable to protect it, to make sure that in the environment it's not going to break down or degrade. Now we're going to go over our bandwidth requirements. Uh, give you a brief understanding. Bandwidth is basically how much information and I put on a fiber and have it transmit or propagate down the fiber in order for it to work. And that includes from the uh, transmission, are we going to put voice on it? Are we going to put video on it? Is it going to be just plain data? And is there going to be telemetry? And again, based on how much of this data is going to be put on the system, you have to know what type of fiber to use because of that. So here you have a chart that shows different kinds of cable. Uh, and to give you an understanding, there are cables made up of the glass, and we're going to call it the glass itself, is made up of a core and cladding. The core, 
that's where the information travels down. The cladding is the glass that is around the core. And that difference of the two index of refraction of those two glasses is what keeps the information in and the wave propagating down by reflecting off of the inside of the, uh, where the joining of the two co the core and the cladding uh, meet. And that's what allows the uh, fiber to, or information to propagate down the fiber. So the first multi-mode fiber that we come across is it's got a 62 and a half micron core surrounded by 125 micron cladding. That's your OM1. Then we have our OM2, which is 5125. And you can see there there's OM1, excuse me, OM2, OM3, and OM4, but they all have the same core and cladding. And the difference between the two is as you go up, as you go from OM1 to OM3 to OM4, you increase the amount of data that you can transmit over a said distance. And you can see if you're using 1 gig, which is the gig distance, or the 10 gig distance, that's your distance limitation on transmitting this data. And then you come to your single mode fiber, which is your 9125. Uh, it's a 9 micron core or surrounded by 125 micron cladding. And that uh, is used for your longer range uh, distances that you're going to transmit. So a lot of times your multi mode is used in buildings, um, small networks, you know, maybe some rings or uh, networks that are around, a, a, say, a municipality or something like that. But generally, um, you're using your your single mode for long distance and your multi mode for short distances. And based on this chart alone, uh, that's what that's saying. Now we're going to go over some types of cable. So again, as I went over, you know, you have your and when they, when we talk about cable, you're really talking about the glass that's inside that cable. That's is the, that's where the specifications and the requirements are based on. Uh, and then on the outside, the jacketing and the, and the strength lever and the Kevlar that's surrounding that glass is what makes it rated for the different applications. So again, we have what they consider your your legacy multi mode, which is your OM1 and OM2. And that's just your standard multi-mode glass. And then you move up to your, op, your laser optimized, which is your OM3 and OM4. And basically what they did was they took this same core cladding, but when they made the actual glass itself, they refined it to work better with the lasers to make it so it is optimized and it is very good at transmitting at the different wavelengths and further distances. Here's some basic data points uh, or uh, specs for the 62125 OM1 you know, that we saw on that other chart. You know, your numerical aperture, and that's how the light gets into the fiber. Um, and then your attenuation per kilometer, and then your your bandwidth that you can you can have as far as the, the bandwidth as far as the uh, wavelength that you're using. You can see here this is the OM2. As you can see, it's starting to get a little bit better. You can send more distance, send more information down uh, at uh, a less of a loss. Again, this is your OM3 and OM4. And again, you're getting better performance here with this laser optimized glass. And then you come to your single mode, and there's a few different single mode fibers. You know, and these are all these all these standards, these G standards are all they may, they need a certain spec for transmitting of that information. And you can see there's a standard single mode, and then there's low water peak. There's bend insensitive fiber, which this fiber is pretty unique in the fact that you can almost bend it on itself, and you'll have very low or no attenuation. And for certain applications, uh, that comes into play. Uh, and it's a good uh, good feature to know about. And then you have your non-zero dispersion shifted fiber, which is used in certain applications, uh, depending on the equipment that you're using. And here, this is the, the specs for the fiber. Again, nine. It says 9.3. A lot of people call it 9125, but it actually the core size is 9.3 plus or minus a half a micron. You can see the numerical aperture is significantly lower than the other multi modes. 
and the attenuation is far less in the multimodes and uh, the dispersion there uh, per kilometer is low also. So now we're going to look at some uh, inside plant cable. Um, and inside plant cable is the stuff that's going to be, you know, in a controlled environment. So um, it's pretty, it's pretty general cable. Uh, it can be used anywhere inside. You don't want to bring an indoor cable outside, and it's made to be in an indoor environment. Uh, and you have distribution, breakout, and cordage. Your distribution will be fiber that's used as, say, like a backbone, and it's going to feed an entire building, and then it's going to be uh, go into a box or a piece of equipment, and then you're going to displace on other equipment to that uh, or other connectors to that. Then you have your breakout cable, and your breakout cable is designed to be terminated directly with connectors on the end of it because it's made up such that each individual fire, fiber is able to be broken out from the large bundle, and I'll, you'll see pictures in a little bit, and it can be terminated directly. Distribution, sometimes you have to build it up or you have to put a breakout uh, cable uh, or fan out kit to help transition it from the large to the small. And then your cordage is, that's just your, your single mode and multi-mode patch cords that you would encounter that are in data centers that plug equipment together and, and stuff like that. So here you see a couple different types of pictures of cable along the upper right-hand corner. Um, and it shows this. there's primarily two types of cable. You have indoor and outdoor. I mean, yes, that's two classifications. Uh, you have indoor and outdoor cable, but the outdoor cable, there's a bunch of different kinds of those. And also indoor cable, there's a bunch of different kinds uh, that make up that. But that's primarily, it's either, like I said before, it's either indoor cable or it's outdoor cable. And then what I was saying about that buffer tube fan out kit is used to convert. You can see those large bundles that have, you know, there's outside jackets, then there's Kevlars inside there, then there's uh, strength members, and then there's other uh, little tubes in there that the fibers are in. And some are loose tubes, and some are uh, tight buffered. So that's the different ways that the fiber will come, and you have to be able to break those out to your specific use. Here I was talking about, here's your distribution cable that I was talking about. So you can see it's got the black core on the outside. That's that uh, heavy jacket that does the protecting. And then there's some strength member, in the, which is the white material uh, that's in there, or sometimes that could be um, armored. Well, this doesn't look to be armored. Uh, that's probably just a strength member. And then you can see the individual colored fibers. That's the tight buffer uh, fiber that's in there. And then the, the uh, little white stock that's coming out of the middle of each of the color is your uh, fiber. And that's a single strand. So you can see the makeup um, that they come out 900 micron. This is 900 micron type buffer distribution cable. And you can have anywhere from two up to 244 counts of these. And uh, you can see, you know, you can take this and you can you know, lay one wire and you have a bunch of, or excuse me, lay one fiber, you have a bunch of different channels and, and whatnot to use what you need to do as you can. And you don't have to use all of them. They can stay in dark until you need them. So uh, and they're very popular for distribution cables to run around buildings and stuff like that. Here I was talking about this is the breakout cable. And you can see it's got the outer jacket. And it's got the uh, a little shield, the little white protective. And then it's got the individual yellow jackets with it looks like hairs coming up out of the little yellow tube, and that is the Kevlar strength member. Uh, and then out of that is tight buffered cable. And that's what I meant was you can take those, each individual one of those, and you put, can put connectors on the ends of those. You can terminate them. Uh, and you don't have to worry about breaking down or using a fan out kit or anything as such to terminate that. And that's why it's considered breakout cable. Now we're going to look a little bit at a uh, outside plant cable. Uh, generally, outside plant cable is loose tube, um, and you're going to see what that means by loose tube. But basically, it's all the fibers are in individual tubes. Uh, there's no Kevlar strength member around the actual fibers, and there are 250 micron 
uh, diameter. So uh, they need to be protected. And there's a bunch of other uh, protective coatings and jacketings on the outside of those. And as you can see, this is definitely a loose tube uh, cable. Uh, you can see the black outside jacket, then there's an inner core, and then there's a central duct. Um, and you can see the fibers come straight out there and they're colored. Now they're done generally, like I said, 250 microns in diameter. Uh, they need to be either, they're generally used in, the, you would splice on a connector to the end of that in a, uh, and then put that in a splice box or in a, in a junction box. Sometimes in that central strength number there's a gel uh, to keep water from accumulating. A lot of times they're moving towards uh, have our strength member that actually blocks the water or absorbs the water to keep it out or push it to keep it from moving. It swells and keeps the, the water from getting in there. Water can cause problems. It can affect fiber over time. Um, so and water will damage fiber. Uh, so that's why that you know if this is going underground or it's going to be outside, uh, you want to look at some type of a, either a gel filled fiber or a uh, Kevlar. Uh, that wicks the water away or blocks the water. So, but you can see how this is the loose tube. Again, here's some tight buffered, a picture of tight buffered cable where that's an outside jacket, uh, or you know, the outer jacket's black. And generally when the jacket's black, it's usually an outdoor or an indoor outdoor cable because that black generally denotes that it's got some type of uh, UV protection. And then there's Kevlar strength member that looks like the hair that's coming out of that. And then the individual fibers that are micron, uh, 900 micron. Uh, you can use a fan out kit for those. You can splice directly to another 900 micron pigtail that's in a, in a splice contained in a box. So that's again what tight buffered. Again, tight buffered is the fact that the cable or the jacketing around the actual glass fiber is attached to it. So uh, it's not loose. So you have to strip it off. That makes it tight buffered. Now you see here we have an example. This would be another an outdoor cable uh, that is armored. And you can have many different types. You can have single, double, triple armor designs. Uh, there may be an external uh, armoring that goes on the outside. And then there may be another layer of armor on the inside. Uh, and these are generally for when you're you know, either lashing it to something that's aerial it's being directly buried underground, or it's going to be lashed to a cell tower. Uh, there's different features for that. And you can see there it says rodent protection. Rodents generally chew through anything, but you, know, you put a couple things of armor on the outside of a cable, it's more of a deterrent, or it will take a long time for them to chew through it. So. Armored cable, generally when it's like this, it's, it's, it's an outdoor application. You can use armored indoor for indoor applications also, but generally it's outdoor and a lot of times direct bury. And they again also have the dry water block protection or sometimes they're gel filled also to keep the water from ingress. But let me go back to that. You can see here, in the, in the, I'm going to call it in the top middle, that again looks like that loose tube configuration, whereas the one on the far right, but it's all yellow. That's more of an armored uh, that strength member and 900 micron type buffer that's coming out. Then you have uh, some submarine cables, or these are cables that are used in water, and you can see, you know, that centralized strength member in there is probably it looks like it's copper tube. You can see there's also aluminum strands that are wrapped around a black core. All that is doing is it's protecting that fiber because once that fiber breaks, it's very difficult. Again, imagine if this is under on the sea floor or you know buried underground 20 feet. If something breaks because something fell on it. You got to dig down in there and you got to open that up and you repair it. So that's why when this Fiber basically is laid, and it's, it's and all the strength member and protection is put on here. It's meant to stay there and never be disturbed. In ways, what, what you're thinking again, especially think about it being under the, on the sea floor, or under or buried in the sea floor. Now we're coming across some ribbon cable, and you can see, in generally, ribbon cable is used in 
indoor applications, or it can be used in outdoor. It'll be a conduit. But this, you know, is a method that they started using uh, pretty, pretty, you know, on a, on, a, on a larger scale as time goes on. Because what you can do, you got 12 fibers here that are placed 125 microns, you know, from center to center. And you can see on these things that there's 12. Usually, it's written fibers, 12 count. But this, are, you can see how small they are and how much amount of space. They don't take up a lot of space, and these are generally used for these MPO or MPP connectors, which is a multi-position cable. Um, you can have their 12 on here, and these are used in data centers where you have a lot of connections and you have to worry about connector size uh, in real estate. You know, everything's going smaller so you don't have as much space between all the different racks and, and whatnot. So you have to come up with this idea and you know these ribbons will be terminated inside one connector. So you can see the size of one standard SC connector and MPO or MPP connector is about the same size and you're getting one connection versus 12 at a time. So you can see the cost savings based on the real estate savings you have there. But basically, usually river fiber is used internal. And you have some other indoor-outdoor cable designs and ratings uh, that we're going to go over. But you can see indoor-outdoor cable, basically what that, that means is the cable can be used outdoors. And then you can run it indoors for a certain distance, depending on the fire code. And a lot of times, like you see here, it's 50 feet. So it allows you to run fiber outside. It can withstand the outside UV, temperature, weather, and then run inside. And as long as it gets to within a junction box within 50 feet of the building where you can then either break it out, splice in indoor cable to that area, uh, that's that's the, that's the benefit of the outdoor indoor outdoor cable designs. Here's a cable that they sometimes call this egg figure eight, um, but you can see that metal cable up top, and that's used basically to suspend this aerially. So this is a, an aerial application with fiber. So the strength member is just for lashing the top of it. And in the cable, you can see kind of rides along on the bottom in that specific setup there for going from building to building. Here's something kind of interesting. We have some composite cables that they have both fiber as well as power or electrical conductors. You can have you know, twisted pair phone lines in there. You can carry coax cable can be in some of these. And it's used, you know, you can transmit light, power, and uh, telephone if you have to for whatever reason. But it's basically a customized cable that you can get. And a lot of times, you know, this will be custom. And you go and say, hey, I have this application. I need these <laughs> factors in here. And companies can make these for you. So again, just to kind of go over things, you know, we have the cordage. And that's just your single mode fiber multi-mode, your patch cords, what that's used for. Then you have your distribution, and that's where it's got the many fibers inside a central cable, and it's used to break out to uh, tie equipment together. And then you have your breakout cable that can go from one building to the other building, and then can be directly terminated. Then we have your loose tube outside plant. Again, this is where you're just running massive amounts of fiber in an area, whether it's in conduit or it's lashed above to, to, a, to a tower or a raceway. And that's used to, to get from building to building. And then you have your armored version of it, same thing for that protection. And then you have your ribbon fiber. Uh, and you can't forget your aerial cables that you know are self-supporting your uh, ADSS type cables. Here's some. These are basically uh, fire codes or uh, flame and uh, ratings for what and this will be printed on the outside of the jacket. You know, OFN versus OFC. You know, an OFC obviously, if it's conducted, it has you know armor jacketing in it or some type of metal in it. You know, your OFNG or your OFCG, general purpose. There's no metal in there, or there may be, um, but it's used for general purpose. And then obviously your OFN, OFNR. 
and OFNP, and you have plenum rated and riser rated, uh, and these are used for uh, fire codes. Again, plenum rated, you know, you can't when it, if it if it catches fire, it can't expel smoke in an area where people will breathe that. Uh, where the riser is, it can burn, but it's generally not in areas uh, that the smoke will accumulate if it smolders. Uh, because that plastic can be toxic, and that would be in, like, say, an elevator shaft or something that runs up, up and down. These vertical runs, they can be the riser fire ratings. Able deployment. So, again, we kind of touched this already, but where is your fiber or outside, if it's going to be outside, how is it going to be placed? And you have a couple different aerial op applications. You have lashed, where you take standard fiber. When I say standard, it's outdoor fiber, and it may be armored. And you lash it to a guide wire that's there. Or maybe there's a pipe that you can lash it to. Or there is duct that you can lash it to. That's the one way that would be lashed aerial. Then you have the self-supporting. And if you remember from before, the one fiber that had the metal up top, and the fiber below it, and that's the self-supporting. Uh, and they actually have two types of self-supporting fiber. They have then the figure eight is what they call, and that was what the example was before. But then they have this stuff called ADSS, which is all dielectric self-supporting. So uh, you can lash lash this. Actually, you don't even have to lash it. You have to just secure it in certain areas, and there's certain areas in which it can hang without being, say, tied to a telephone pole because it's self-supporting. But there's no metal in it. It's all dielectric, which means it's non-conductive. Then your other version is underground cable. You can put under you can put cable in duct or a conduit and bury it. There's fiber that's actually direct bury also, and then your HSBS installation. Now, if your fiber is going to be placed inside, where is it going to be placed? Again, we can, this is very similar to the outside, only it's indoor. You have inner duct, which is like conduit, which is like plastic tube that's running around. The fiber will be in there. There's cable trays or cable runs or raceways where you've seen. And uh, the, best, the best example that I can come up with is if you've been in a Home Depot or a Lowe's and you, or even a grocery store and you look up in the air and you see the trays that are like racks made of wire and you see blue cable, you see yellow cable, and the uh, orange cable laying in them. That's a cable tray or a cable run. Uh, if they just put the data, that's for doing computer stuff or whatever within the building, fire alarms, if you lay it in the cable there because it's, it's easy to get to if there's an issue. Kind of environment. You know, if you consider it an inside plant, you know, again, you're inside a building just like yourself. You know, the temperature, humidity, it's it's consistent. You know, there's there's multiple moves, adds and changes where you have to be able to get to them. When you in a building where you have to add, you know, people, too many people get hired, so you have to run them on a phone line because I'm not run on a computer line. So that's why in plant, you know, that's the type of environment that you're going to be able to get at, and that's why they put those cables and raceways and stuff uh, stuff like that or trays. Outside plant, you, get your, you know, the fiber needs to be able to withstand that harsh environment, temperature, wind, sun, storms, earthquakes, any type of weather in nature. Uh, and that's where you're not going to, once it's there, it's pretty much you're putting it, you don't want you, once you lay it or you install it, you don't want to play with it, you're just going to leave it there. And that's why a lot of times that stuff is buried, it's armored, and you can't want you to put it in, you can't get it, you can't see it. And here's some, you know, considerations for fiber itself, you know, with temperature, weather, jacket, you know, they make different types of outside jackets, they have poly, polyethylene, PVC, polyurethane. There's a bunch of different materials out there, and some materials react well indoors versus outdoors, and some don't. So that's why there's specific table selections for, you know, indoors or outside, outdoors. Uh, which would be your jacket, jacket material. Your cable size in relation to fiber count, start getting really high count, but fiber gets pretty thick and it gets heavy, so a lot of times, you know, you want those things to be inside or outdoor cables, you know, are going to be the larger cables. 
and they're going to be hard to move around. That's why a lot of times you bury them. And you have to, you know, think about the equipment on where this is going to be. You need your space required for your hardware, your, your panels and racks and hubs. You need power for this. Uh, is it going to be easy to get to, hard to get to? So again, when we're going to selecting your cable, you know, again, is it going to be buried? Is it going to be aerial? Is it going to be raceway? So because of what other stuff is going to be integrated into this cable. Now we're going to go over, uh, went over cable pretty good. Now we're going to go over connectors and polish. You can see over here we have some connector types, cleaning, mechanical, and splices, and fusion splices. That's some extra information in there. So basically we got we show here this is a connector. This is a, a general connector to give you an idea. Uh, the main thing that you want to come at, come away from this picture is you have on the right hand side. Uh, you have your connector, and on the left hand side they're showing a, a, they call it a coupler, a sleeve, a lineman sleeve, or some people call them adapters, mating sleeves. Basically a mating sleeve is used to make two connect fiber optic connectors connect together to each other. And here's considerations again, there's cost, installation, your budget, uh, size, that they need to be 2.5 millimeter versus 1.5 millimeter ferrules, and what that does that you know as you go down in size, you get more real estate to use, and it's it's just like fiber uh, repeatability. You know, each time you mate and demate, is it going to give you the same results? And the time you have an ability to do quick termination, which is like a splice on connector, or can you epoxy and polish, which generally you don't hand polish anymore, uh, or do you splice on a, a pigtail? Or do you have the anaerobic style, where it's you know a quick uh, melt and, and hardening of a epoxy? So here you have pictured here are the three main 2.5 millimeter connectors: you have an ST, FC, and SC. Pretty much, the ST was the uh, first connector on the you know on the scene years ago. Uh, and then they kind of improved that uh, to, to the FC or Frank Charlie because that the Frank Charlie outside jacket has a thread that they thought that that would be better to keep it uh, a, a good connection with the thread. And then they went then once and that was all made of metal. Then they went to the uh, cheaper version. When I say cheaper, more it's the cheaper cost to manufacture, and uh, they would drive the price down. But they're still quality connectors. Uh, but it's just a plastic housing, and that's your SC, and that's you know, the, really the main connector that's used nowadays. Again, these are 2.5 millimeter. And then you have some some older that CF45 violation. That's an older. Let me see what this. Yeah, 3M designed this, and this 283 clean bare fibers placed on you know 4.5 millimeters apart and holds fiber. It's a V groove. It's a is almost like a, a almost like a mechanical connection that's used. And then you have your LC, your MTRJ, and your MU, and they are all 1.25 millimeter connectors. And when I say 1.25 millimeter and 2.5 millimeter, you heard me say it's the diameter of the ferrule that's used in the connector, and that's what it comes down to. And we're going to go over some connector polishes. You can see here there's five different types of connector polishing. And then when they say the polish, it's the end face that you're really concerned about. You can see it's flat, PC, XPC, UPC, and APC. Nowadays, there's really two polishes that are really primarily the ones that are used in probably 95% of all applications as far as polish goes, and that's the UPC. And the APC. And what I want you to take away from this actual slide here is the back reflection that you see on the two connectors. You have a negative or greater than negative 55 back reflection for the UPC and negative 70 dB back reflection on the APC. The APC has a eight degree angle. Um, and that's why the back reflection is 
much better. And you can think about it this way. The higher the negative number from back reflection, the better connection it is. And basically what that's saying is whenever you have a signal that's transmitted and it comes across with two connectors interface, some of the energy that's being sent out is reflected back based on how well the polish and phase geometry of the connectors are. And the lower, the higher the negative number, which means lower power is coming back, that's better. That's what you want. That's where you want to see less information or, or uh, radiation coming back because that comes back and it goes back in the laser. It can damage the laser. Down the road, that can be what has your, you know, when you're sending data down there, you know, that can give you error rates and stuff like that, the wrong bits and stuff like that and have problems. So mainly what you want to come away from this is nowadays UPC and APC are the connectors that you really want. And you can see here as I was going over the uh, UPC, which is the top, versus the AP, APC, which is the bottom, which is, has that eight degree angle. Um, and that's basically a pectoral of the difference between the two. Again, this is going over the APC physical contact. And that's why another thing that all connectors, these fiber optic connectors, there actually is a physical contact. That's what the PC is. It's angled physical contact. UPC is ultra physical contact. They make a, they actually touch the two ferrules, the two white ceramic surfaces touch and make that physical contact. And the pressure that's exerted on the end cases of those two connect the two ferrules is roughly 40 to 45,000 kpsi. So there's a lot of pressure that uh, is exerted on the ends of these connected mm -hmm. cases. So you got some optical communication, you know, considerations. You know, there's transmitter, there's electrical to opto, modular and circulatory. Uh, light sources you have, you have your LED, your laser, and your pixel. These are all ways that light is transmitted. Uh, the medium this is all being transmitted on is your glass, and or in some cases plastic is used in fiber. Uh, the different types of connectors that we went over, your ST, FC, SC, and LC. And also uh, then you have your receivers, which are your photo detectors, your decoders, uh, and that's going from optical to electrical. Uh, in some cases, that's like media converters. So these are the, in optical communication, these are the different, like you could say, buzzwords or categories that you want to be aware of. And basically, that comes to the end of our webinar here. Um, not sure if anybody has any questions um, directly. You can type in the chat session. Um, I can answer a couple of questions, or you can email sales at fiberoptic.com for any questions that you may have, and I would be more than happy to answer those for you. So with that, I think we are uh, going to end our webinar for the day, and I thank everybody for attending. And Enjoy your afternoon. And again, if you have any questions, you can see here. You can send an email to training or sales. Uh, and you can even ask for Joe. My name is Joe Chiron again. And uh, I will be happy to uh, answer any questions for you. Have a great day. Thank you.